I'll let you into a secret. I'll let you all into a secret. Last time on Your Geek Fix, we talked to Chris Bernardo of The Wand Company about his journey of making fantasy into reality. Join us today for an even bigger episode when Chris shares some of his deepest prop building secrets. No one, I've never told anyone that. Don't miss what could be the most exciting episode thus far. Two policemen pointing their guns at me, saying step back from the weapon. We are chatting with Chris on Skype video call. The person whom you're <laughs> reached is oh. currently unavailable. Oh. Please leave a message after the beep. Uh, sorry. Let's see. Oh, there you are. Oh, there you are. Ah, oh, that works. Works. Oh, you, got, you got Wally in the background there, I see. Oh, yes, right, right, right. Yeah. One of my favorite things. <laughs> I curated the... Uh, Normally, I, I looked at when lockdown happened, I realized that no one actually curated the background behind those things. And normally broadcast quality footage, which in the old days when I was working advertising, was like a really big wow. Right. That is, no one gives, no one gives a crap what they, it's just <laughs> everything, any old, any old rubbish, and it's all like breaking up and they go, you know, no even says, sorry, this transmission may not be of, of excellent quality. In the B, for the BBC, if they showed a news clip and it even wasn't 100% broadcast quality. It would always say, not, you know, not full quality. Or now no you one cares. The there. <laughs> so first of all, I've, I've, I've raised my computer up because I asked Rachel yesterday is, is like, um, I, now you say, I want to look at you, but if I look, if I look down slightly because my camera's above. And I think one of the great things that technology could do is have a camera that was actually embedded in the screen somehow. Yeah, so that right you, when you looked at the person, you're actually looking into their eyes, they're looking straight back at you and it would really work like that. But then, as I say, what I did yesterday was I, I said to Rachel, uh, who's, who's our social person, what can you see behind me? Right. So that's a picture, that is a picture of my daughter oh, uh, done. Yeah, okay. And there's a weird thing with that picture is it's uh, a watercolor of a photograph that her, boy, her partner took, but it's done using Waterlog, oh, which yeah. is a watercolor like app. Mm -hmm. And when I took it in, I printed it on watercolor paper. I took it in to be framed, and the frame shop said, "Oh my God, where did you get this watercolor done?" <laughs> it's just, it's just, <laughs> it's an just app something. <laughs> yeah, that's so weird because it looks so, it looks so watercolory. <laughs> um, but anyway, so there you go. I I think one of the things that, that's cool about the uh, before I forget about it about your wands. Um, now, I mean, you've done similar things, of course, with like the Sonic and things. But one of yeah. the things I like about the wand is that, that I think is a simple technology uh, is that you have no matter which way it's up, it knows it's up. So if, 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 if it's turned this way, yeah. that is officially up. It knows th which way is up. You don't have to overthink which way you're going to be putting it. Um, and I'm guessing fairly simple thing that's that's doing that fits all in that little tiny space. Everything. Well, that's, that's, yeah, that's first, pretty... there's a couple of things there. So first of all, the little tiny space is mm -hmm. that we did some work for a company. We worked on a company, uh, Universal Electronics. They, they pretty make, they make a bulk of the remote controls in the US. And there's, they have a, and we, I, I worked on another company, a venture capital funded company that I started with, uh, with Richard working as well, uh, making a display technology using electroluminescent technology. Now that's a lovely material that you can buy. It, it runs at high voltage, like 400 volts and 40,000 hertz, whatever. It's oh, quite a different yeah. thing to power. You can buy them online, yeah. sheets of, and it's what used to be behind those Timex watches that went like that green glow. Yeah. The trouble is it has a very short half-life. It, it, it goes a bit spotty and it sort of damages after uh, two or 3,000 hours of use. Gotcha. But for a remote control, which only has to light up when you touch it, that's more than enough. And we made this remote control called the Chameleon, and it sold about a hundred million dollars worth of product over the space of about two years from a standing cold call that I made. And so it was a really, that was how we started off in remote controls. Wow. And, but I was always amazed that all our electronics to drive the display took up most of the board, but the, the remote control bits was like one chip and a few components around it. Mm -hmm. So it dawned on me that actually it would be quite easy to put that into a wand. And, mm -hmm. and one of the things about the wand, which you, which you probably alluded to, is it doesn't look like a normal toy which has a seam down the side and screw holes in it. Yeah. It had to be made in such a way that it all fitted in from the ends. And when you actually looked at it, it just looked like a piece of wood. That was the idea. <clears throat> it, 
in terms of it being the right way up and it always knowing that is that technology about five years or six years before would not when harry potter came out or 10 years before would not have been possible for us it came about because they have sensors inside car steering wheels for airbags which are accelerometers and they can sense the amount of deceleration or acceleration very very sensitively and uh, i'll talk a bit more about that in a second but because they were made in their multi multi millions for cars and a bunch of other technology like telephones and you know mobile phones and things um they came down to just like under a dollar so oh. once you've got once you've got a massive important component like that that's coming down in price maybe it's a dollar maybe it's 80 cents you can start to think about all the little things that you could put it into that maybe haven't had things in them before now richard and i both worked for a research and development consultancy called cambridge consultants mm -hmm. which was part of the the company is now gone bust called chap uh, gone chapter 11 called arthur d little but we worked for that it was like a contract research and development consultancy so we were doing heavy duty r d for companies big companies like Pfizer, Kodak, you know, companies that actually had big organizations themselves, but needed expertise in areas. Right. So Richard is a very, very expert electronics guy. And he said we could use one of these accelerometers in the wand. Because my original idea was a wand which had buttons on it, somewhere oh. hidden, like touch areas yeah. or something. And he said, he actually, I remember the bit when he was, he was, we were sitting in the office and I was explaining it to him because he was working in a company and I was, I was working at home. And he said, my phone, he said, if I do this, it's got an accelerometer which knows which way up it is. Right. If we could put that accelerometer in the wand, oh, I said, that'd be killer. Yeah. He went and told his wife, and his wife said, if you can do that, that is monster, that product. So it started there. As a, it was a joint idea. I had the idea of the wand from making the, the wand it, on Dad Can Do. And I had this idea that maybe certain bits of it would be flexible. You could press them or you could touch them. They could be touch sensitive. And he came up with the idea of the, the, the moving. Now, with the accelerometer, it is a micro machined piece of silicon which has these little levers and mm -hmm. I, i'm not kidding they are microscopic right oh right so they you can imagine they don't weigh very much yeah and one lever hangs this way one lever's this way and one lever's the other way where whichever way it is that way. so all, all tilt and, technology yeah and, and but the levers mm -hmm. they're not they're not articulated they are literally machined out of bits of silicon oh okay? wow now, really? as as gravity presses down on that bit of silicon, yeah, which weighs nanograms, all right, at the end of the silicon, it causes stress, which causes an electric current to flow, or it causes some kind of sense to flow. So when the if the chip is resting this way up, this is being pressed down just by the force of gravity. Uh -huh. It knows which way up it is. Oh, this wow. one's being pressed this way, but this one isn't being pressed at all because it's just it's just resting. The gravity is pressing on top, so it's not being bent. Right. And the other ones at the other angle is being pressed down the other way. So it knows from those three things which way round it is. And Richard's software, which is very compact and a tiny little chip of its own, as you rotate it round, say you rotate it to there, it recalibrates in about a quarter of a second to say, actually, this is my new up based on... Oh, this man. one being pressed, this one being pressed, and that one being pressed. Now, if I go like this, yeah. I move it. I'm bending those a little bit more, but it already knows which way is the new up. Wow! I had this assumption that there was something that was just—it it was just a simple thing. But you're talking about something that it, it, highly sensitive, unbelievable. Yeah, it's constantly look calibrating accelerometers. <laughs> yeah, and wow. and the fact that you're making a measurement every few, every fraction of every fraction of a second to say. How much is gravity pressing on these different bits? If I hold the wand. Now, the great thing about a wand is that you normally design it to, you normally think you'd be holding it pointing straight out. Here's a pen. So I haven't got one on me, but pointing in this direction. Mm -hmm. If you hold it up like this, the wand knows it's pointing upwards. Yeah. And then you can set, say, that's an unusual way of holding it. So we were worrying about how you could program it. So if you hold it upwards and tap it a couple of times, or so it would go into a programming mode because it's quite an unusual thing to do. Because right. one of the things to do with something that has no buttons on it is how do you get into programming mode? How do you give feedback? So we needed a, we needed a vibration motor inside it, which originally was like the dragon's heart pulsing, the heart yeah. string pulsing in your hand. So once you've got the heartbeat pulsing in your hand, you think, well, if it pulsed twice or three times or five times, it's a bit complicated. But then you tell everyone, 
a wand is an easy thing to get to use. You've got to practice. You've got to become an expert at it. Right. So, in fact, a lot of things worked in our favor. It's not a simple thing. You just pick up and it just works straight away. You do have to get. You do have to learn how to use it. Yeah. So, that that works in our favor. But it's 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 the way of an old boss of mine used to say: make a virtue out of a necessity. Yeah. Turn turn something in your life. Turn something around that's difficult. And think the positive flip side of it. How could you make it into something good? So I think if you think about that with your products, or, or in fact things you do, there's always a, there's always a slight benefit to what you're doing. So so related to this, because we're talking about sensors and space and things like that. Of course, there's got to be the 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 sharing of the. So uh -huh. there's this. Yeah. At, at, at the same time, um, you know, when I was in film, they, they have a term in film that the problem with film as an art is that it's a business. And the problem with film as a business is that it's an art. Like yes. you, you have to have an understanding of, and you have to, and you have to respect both sides of it. Um, and so, the radio, even in the new version, it has these these neat little features that I really like a lot. I love how it lights up. You fit everything into this area right here. It was that was a an enormous challenge. Yeah, it well, really it's, was. And it's this is all off one set of batteries too. And I, I actually, the batteries ran down during that update video. And so during right. the update video, I was talking about the fact that it can talk. And I just, uh, uh, perfect timing, it says, Power cells low. You know, it even tells you when the yeah, batteries yeah. are running well, low. Well, there's, there's another thing about that. We, we wanted, uh, when we were doing the wand, we, uh, the sonic screwdriver, we wanted to approach one of the actors from the oh. BBC, who's the sound, the voice of the TARDIS. And we thought, well, we could use the voice of the TARDIS. Oh, wow. Uh, the actor, actress's name or actor's name is Saran Jones. And she's, she's a lovely person. We, we had a little bit of contact with the BBC. They're, they're a peculiar, we had a lot of contact with the BBC, but we had a little bit of contact with the talent. We got in contact with um, David Tennant. Uh, that is a funny story on its own right, that, that when we wanted to do it, we said we want to make a very accurate attempt, Dr. Sonic. Mm -hmm. And the BBC said, oh, well, in that case, you can go to Wales, where we have our special show there, where we have one of the originals. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, for people who don't really know, and, and I would accept that I don't know these, the geography of the US, don't know the geography of the UK, that is a four and a half hour drive. Right. Okay. There and the four and a half hours back. So right. uh, we get in the car to go there. So you've got to imagine you've got to write off the whole day to go there. We get there, it's a replica. It's not the real thing at all. It, it was a replica by, mm. made by somebody else, not even made by the person who made the original. So where is the original? No one knows where it is. And the BBC, someone says, I think we gave it to David Tennant when he left the show as a kind of parting gift. Uh -huh. So uh, in prop collecting worlds, guys like him who get a thing like that have no idea that that thing's probably worth a couple of hundred K. Right. They could easily sell it, you know, if they wanted to. They don't want to sell it. It's probably it's right. in his attic somewhere, you know, in his loft or whatever. So uh, Richard said, don't worry, I'll ring him up. And I'll <laughs> see if we can borrow it. <laughs> Literally said, yeah, right. Good luck with that one yeah. then, Richard. Anyway, yeah. I don't know, about half an hour later, I hear him saying, yeah, yeah, like it's on the phone, yeah. Uh, okay, well, we do need it a bit urgently. Is there any chance you could come and get it tomorrow? So I'm thinking, what? We're going we're gonna to 3D scan it. We can give it, we can give it right back. So uh, as it turns out, he's talking to the agent. Oh, yeah. And the agent said, yeah, I've spoken to him. And yeah, you can have it. And yeah, you can go and get it tomorrow. Just uh, here's his address. Just pop down to his house and uh, the housekeeper will give it to you or whatever. It, it comes wrapped in a bit of kitchen roll in a carrier bag, in a grocery bag. Right? <laughs> we, we got a special box for it. We yeah. put it all in a box. We scanned it. Um, so, yeah, quite good fun. OK. And then we think that was easy. Let's approach one of the actors if they can do a little voiceover for us. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So uh, we ask her 25 grand oh, to wow. voice a load of words for the, and that's one off, a one off thing. Right. Plus, if we want any extra words, it'd be a pain in the ass. So Richard went and found online some software where you type in letters and you get it read, read out. Right. It, it cost quite a bit. So he just bought, I think, like 20,000 words worth of it when it was quite cheap early on before they started making it expensive. So we've got this credit and it sounds 
vaguely English, vaguely kind of like uh, technical. We got we use the same voice, although it's American version for I think for the tricorder, and it sounds like a ship's computer without bad, without sounding really bad. Yeah. But it is actually really cool. And then he massively compresses them to fit them onto the little chips. Usually we only have enough for a, a few K. Right. So getting the words that we'd like to get on. But for the communicator, it was like, um, for the one, for the Sonic, it was power cell, power cell, oh. the power cell low or power cell needs regenerating, regenerating and stuff like that. We, we, we actually, at the beginning of each project, we come up with a series of words that are words that mean the same thing, but are relevant to that particular. So they have a kind of relevance. So if it's power cell regeneration, because doctors regenerate, Doctor right. Who, they regenerate. So it's it's saying, yeah, you wouldn't say power cell, you know, charging, you might say regenerating. So we would try and think of the words that actually mean something within that universe, but are still realistic. Well, in some of these shows, they actually have languages and, and words that if you don't get it right, the people know. So yeah, so, yeah, I think, yeah. That's, but the, but Doctor Who, there's some, so there's quite a bit of liberty in that. I think I would think there is, and and then of course we had the the fact that um, Richard was doing it was beeping, mm. and I said it'd be really cool if it if it if it stayed when it was when it was upright if it because it's got big batteries in it, it can just stay alive flashing every so often, and then maybe it it, it wakes up and it does some kind of communications with you, yeah. and then Richard came back and said. Well, what about Morse code? And I was thinking, well, yeah, because Morse code is like an old-fashioned way of communicating, and the and the sonic screwdriver is like a time machine in its own right, because obviously it's going through time back and forth. So why not use a very robust old-fashioned way of communicating? Yeah. And then Richard said, yeah, and, and actually Morse is pretty easy to do; it's low low amount of code. Then he'll go away and learn it, right. pretty much. I mean, not completely like a proper. Uh, a, to, you know telegraph guy but he'll learn it and then this is where richard adds to the creativity because he, he wouldn't have done this originally but then he goes he comes back and goes yeah well it's the 11th doctor sonic so it's got 11 doctor sonic's phrases from the 11th doctor so oh. if and they're random so if it's standing up it, it flashes after one minute it goes doo -doo 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 -doo, which says sonic okay and then every hour but wait for this it's every 1964 seconds which is from the first Doctor Who. That's all shit. That is pretty cool. <laughs> uh, it does. It does. Uh, it does one random eleventh Doctor's uh, phrase, catchphrase, like oh. "bow ties are cool" or whatever. Right. And it does. And then we don't say anything about what the phrases are in the manual. Wow. So you have to go. You have to so listen to them. To learn something. Decode it. Yeah. Whatever oh. it is, and, and obviously people do that. Um, yeah, it's stuff like that. And, and for example, the wand, mm -hmm. I think, I'm, I'm hope I'm certain in thinking that each section of the wand is a prime number of millimetres. And if you take the whole lot, it's a prime number also when they are added together wow. of millimetres. No one, I've never told anyone that. Wow. But I'm pr pretty <laughs> sure, measure it later and, and correct if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that is, if you've got one, I'll measure it later. But I think that's that was the intention anyway. Yeah. And there's so many things when you're designing a product that get lost along the way. Mm -hmm. You know, you start to design it and then the factory changes something. I mean, inside the communicator, when you open it, there's a thing on the back, if you do manage to take it all apart, that says uh, property of Starfleet. You know, if you've got this far, please take this to your nearest star, base, base, star station because you shouldn't be doing this sort of thing. Right. And that's fun because it's just in the mold and it's easy to do it free. So yeah. you may as well put stuff like that in. But the original centre bit, there's a centre bit of aluminium round Inside, I wanted to have filigree like a sort of church, like like sort of flying buttresses from a church. So the design of the internal bits, because I thought, well, it's anyway, very quickly when the factory got hold of it, they sort of simplified it and they, they said, oh, no, we can't do that. But they oh. could easily do it. Yeah. And I think with the modern stuff that we're doing now, because in those days we were doing it, we were just drawing it in 2D on a Illustrator and giving it to them. And they were doing the tools and coming back and we were changing it and came out of the boards. But now we're doing all our own CAD. Okay. When I want nice things in there, I want nice things in there, and they get in there. So I, I don't know if you did. You have a Pit Boy stand? Did you ever get a? I didn't get the Pit Boy stand. It's no, I didn't do that. Yeah, I the, I, the, well, once I, when I got this set up, that was my original plan, and then honestly, I was originally originally thinking I would display it more out and about, but you made that too nice. Uh, my <laughs> my dad was a salesman, and uh, and something about this. 
That that's where yeah. you saw it. it was like yeah, I, I wanted it like something you'd see in the in the if you walked into the uh, into the actual you know uh, the shop. Yeah, um, and that's it. That, that's exactly how I what it is. It. In fact, it was copied from. It was copied. It was parodied from a 1940s uranium uh, k- kid for kids. Oh yeah, right. I, I know that kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what it's copied from. Is it really? That was, that was, that is exactly my reference for it. Yeah, wow. you look at the front, look at the handle. Look at the when you yeah. go back and look at the uranium uranium prospecting kit, you'll see wow. the, the uh, and look, because I know there's nothing new under the sun. Right. My first thing is look in the look at the original reference. See right. what there's out there. Start from that point. But I know what you were gonna ask me about the rad, the rad meter. Is that <laughs> when we did the when we did the, red, when we did the well, here, here's a story, and it, it's kind of how it really is, mm-hmm. is we had originally been asked to do the pit boy for the previous for fallout oh yeah for that the the, the the plastic kit and the fully working one okay and when we looked at the fully working one and we had a, those often those games they often think about it late in the day and then you've got a few months to put something together we knew at the time i i think we were working on the one of the sonics or the communicator there was no way we could do our small team we could do a proper job on it and do the sort of job we would want to do right. on the pit that was a previous one. And um, it was a complex project. And anyway, they did really well. And they sold hundreds of K of units. And it was right. brilliant. And we missed, in a way, we missed out on it. Because my kid, the one who loves Fallout, had said to me ages before, you should do a pit boy. It'd be really cool. And we yeah. said, well, uh, pit boy, very complicated, lots of plastic. Then they came to us and said, we're doing a new version of the game. It's, it's the perfect storm of product. It's going to be so big. It's this, that, and the other. Can you do a fully working pit boy? Yeah. Now at that point we were busy, and we had, we were we were working on another project, mm-hmm. and it was like taking up all our time electronics wise. And um, I knew that if we committed to doing the electronic version of the Pit Boy, we would miss the delivery date, mm-hmm. and we'd miss the launch, and if we missed the launch, we would fail, mm-hmm. and we would probably actually as a small company we'd probably go bust. Mm-hmm. So I I said to uh, the guy who's the licensing guy at Bethesda could we have a toy license to make the toy version? And then can we just put the electronics version to one side and do it later? Mm-hmm. And he said, yeah, uh, yeah, great. And, and licensing is, is tricky. And that's why when we started, we didn't have a license for the wand. We just made our own one. But actually, when you get to know the people, it's just a cost. And, mm-hmm. and they're nice guys. And he's a really, he's a great guy, great supporter of us. So um, I then said, well, if I'm going to make a toy, there's no way I'm going to make like a 50 buck toy mm-hmm. of, pit boy because the previous one you could put your phone in it phones have all changed now that's what right, things really right. to do and 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 also bethesda hated doing the app it was complicated mm-hmm. it, it caused problems they when they get towards the end of a project they're in crunch time they're all working 24 7 anyway they don't want to be working on an app for you right and if there's no app, there's no product it's, it's a fail so you have to base in building all of those things so i thought well, i'll make a kit mm-hmm. i mean I loved Airfix kits when I was a kid. Yeah. Those those kind of construction kits where you build yeah. them all the time. And I and I really I built hundreds of them and I loved it. So I thought a kit would be really cool. Actually, a kit's a really hard thing to make because you've got to build it in such a way that it can be built right. afterwards. And I know when you were repairing the radio, you put they said, "Oh, you got to unscrew all these things to do the radio." Right, right, right. Yeah, because I was I was thinking you would build it once. <laughs> I started, and I wasn't really thinking. And I was thinking when I started doing it that actually later we would make a fully functioning one Mm -hmm. and then as we went on with it i realized that if we made a fully functioning one we could be doing that for three or four years Mm -hmm. we would never finish it whereas if we made a series of modules i know that we could make one in a in a in a you know in six months we could make a module and that may that would mean if we had a radio at least the lights would light up Mm -hmm. and and at least the radio would work and then if Mm -hmm. we had a light just a light behind the display would be good a light screen with a light in it um for your listeners out there every single project you take on gets more complicated as you found with the blackberry thing Mm -hmm. it's prone to failure Mm -hmm. it's more complicated than you thought Mm -hmm. it cost more than you thought so the tooling for the pit boy was 350 grand Mm -hmm. three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. so if you don't sell a load you make a loss you go out of business Mm -hmm. and if you make a load and they're rubbish and they break people write to you and they want replacements you go out of business yeah. There's a whole ton of stuff. If if it has the wrong packaging on it, yeah. with the wrong label, 
the Chinese customs won't allow you to export it. It gets stopped at the gate and you have to put stickers on it and things. Mm -hmm. So if ever you see a product out there, guys, if you see a product out there and it's not exactly perfect, right. the, the journey between the idea, if you see a film that looks wrong, the journey between the idea and the final version is right. so long and so full of bear traps and pitfalls and people having their ideas thrown in mm -hmm. and you losing your way. You have an idea, you do a thing, you change it. So this, this copy here, it needs to be moved it needs to be moved up a little bit, one right. millimeter up. And they go, yeah, fine, they move it up one millimeter. You do some other changes to this bit, a month later it comes back, the cop is some magically moved back. Right. Oh, we're gonna yeah. go to print, what's happened? Why did that happen, when did that happen? Yeah. And then, have you got the will to live to move it back again? Right. Which means another few weeks delay, and I'm talking about something trivial like this, right. in, a, in a thing which has a thousand components. But, you know, one thing, one thing related to that is that I, I mean, most of the people I've heard criticisms from are people that don't actually have it in their hands. So they don't appreciate the size that, I mean, we're talking, this is much smaller than I think people realize when they look on a photograph or when they will look at it on video and they just assume, well, there's plenty of room in there. You should be able to cram a bunch of things in there or this should be cheap enough. Why, why aren't you just whatever? Uh, I mean, this is amazing. The, the, all the things that just the radio does in the space that it that it has. The radio was a significant is, challenge. But yeah. How to make how to make a, a speaker sound good. Yeah. Also, those those boxes at the end are really weird shape. They were hard to mold. Yeah. Um, they're not designed in a way that if you were designing a box to mold it like that, you would make it like that. Right. Right. They, it had to be very accurate. That is a one to one accurate thing. And then of course the actual thing in the game, what's one to one? Right. Some, when you got close to some of the things on the table, that, like the the hollow tapes, they're yeah. bigger. Yeah. But when you put, when you hold them in your hand, they're smaller, and there's right. weird like, things going on which you've got to. It kind switches of, up. Um, yeah. So I mean, in terms, of, in terms of the the thing, I can see you looking at there. The those those boxes, those modules there, they <clears throat> they are only exactly big enough to fit two AAA, three AAA batteries. Mm -hmm. they, you can't fit. They're just the length. So when you when you take the radio out, you'll see that one of the contacts at one end for the batteries is the actual PCB. Right. There isn't any space to put contacts in there. Right. That 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 made significant challenges. Um, the grill that you can see there, yeah. just the, the metal okay. grill. Uh, well, that metal grill, but also the one above it, the one oh, with the, yeah. the light. Yeah, this. Getting that made. There isn't a magic grill factory that you go to that says, oh, <laughs> yeah, we can just make those. No from, Don't worry, it'll only be five cents. Yeah. No, it's like, this is going to cost you five dollars yeah. and by the way that isn't in the budget you can't afford that no. so you then go backwards and forwards hundreds of times the factory gets cheesed off you're saying should that be made of plastic people will then come online later and go hey you know why don't they make this thing of metal you go yeah don't think we didn't try for six months to make that out of metal and it right, just right. it just could not happen cool. and all the other things i would like to do i mean you've probably seen online i only a few people watched it, but I did a distressing video of how to distress I, it. I watched that. Yeah. Uh, you and, with... Um, and it's Elva. Yeah. Yeah. And Chronicle. Yeah. And when, when I had, by the way, when my hair all fell out. And <laughs> I, I can just tell you, somebody wrote, somebody wrote, and I just got to get this off my chest, right? Somebody wrote, who designed this manual? They were so lazy. Really? Right. Okay. I was working 18 hour days. I was drawing it. Right. I was negotiating with the Americans. I was negotiating with the Chinese. I was flying 70 days, flying back and forth right. from country to country in 10 months from a standing start to that product, including the manual. Yeah. And yeah, I'd like to have made it better, but I can tell you for certain I was not lazy. <laughs> laziness wasn't part of it. Yeah, so laziness was not one of the things. Yes, mistakes were made. And I, and I think I, I said to you that the, the biggest mistake I made was and it's a hilarious one, it's those screwdrivers. And it's the same mistake you make when you go online to and you buy, say, um, 50 kilos of potatoes by mistake when you just want two, mm -hmm. or you buy one gram of rice when you really wanted a big packet because, mm -hmm. you know, you don't know what you're doing when you buy online. Well, I, I designed these screwdrivers and I thought, genuinely thought they would be a bit bigger. Oh, really? <laughs> and it was right at the end of the project. And, you know, I just didn't have a 3D print made of them. I 3D printed everything else. Uh, they're they're about the size of my, a lot of my other uh, like they're, the smaller they're, screwdrivers. They're, yeah, they're great, but mm. but but there's the other thing is I didn't have time to go round the loop with the screws, so the factory selected the screws. I would have liked oh. the screws to all have been a bit looser, uh -huh. and then they would have worked. When we assembled the first one, I just said, "There's no way these screwdrivers work. The screws are tight, mm. and the screwdrivers are too small." Now in the stand, 
Um, I'll just go and get it, actually. So if you just... Oh, yeah, just yeah. Step, step <clears throat> yeah, in the stand. Now, this is a stand, by the way, that that um, that, that great collector, Andy Hibbs, I don't know if you know him online, but he's he's done the paint job for me. He's made it look all old and rusty. Oh, that is cool. Yeah, I like that. And he's done a nice job of it. Yeah. Um, the great thing about the stand, which you'll see if you if you got one and you you looked inside, is that even the the bits inside which cover over the electronics have got all like mouldings on them, like little bits and features and stuff. But this is the correct size for the screwdriver, so oh, you can so that see. Oh, it's different size. I figured it would be this. It is the same as these. It's a different no, size. I was going to make the same mistake twice. Oh, so here's the screwdriver, and this one is is two ended. Oh, switchable. That is very cool. And it's the same. It's the same. Um, you know, it's the same concept of the name. And oh, okay. this was the size I was imagining in my head was the size of the screwdriver. And in fact, in this thing, it's really nice as it, it fits in a space underneath the, so you All can right, store you sold it. me on the sedan now, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should, say, I should definitely send you one, really. Um, but it, there are a ton of things that I think the average person who has never made something wouldn't understand. I mean, you're, for example, I'm doing this, this stand, okay? Yeah. And I want to make the, I don't know if you can see there, that the bottom's got a kind of pattern on it. It's kind of a texture. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that is pretty and good. It's, it's like a sort of iron plate texture you get on a stair. And then halfway through doing the pro halfway through doing that, when I'm right at the end of the project, they say, oh, by the way, the FCC statement has to go on the back. So we show you what we've done. And they just molded it into the into the base of the thing. They, oh. They've just done it. I said, no way, it can't go there. You can't right. just have, and often when you see products, they've got a great big bit, like a toy, they've got a great big bit of text just stamped into it. That's because literally as it was going to go to, to, to production, someone yeah. has said, oh, by the way, we're missing this, this bit of copy that we didn't tell you had to be on there. Yeah. So in this case, I designed a kind of a, an, a, a space underneath the, the, the screwdriver and I tilted the text at 45 degrees to look like it was part of the pattern. And oh. I just made the text and said, it has to be on there. I'm going to show you how it's going to be. That's perfect. Now, I don't know if you can actually see it there, but yeah. it's... It, it's just in there, it's tiny, but it's there. And it's at that angle too, yeah. yeah. And, that, and that's the deal, and that, but, but my, my guess is that for most products, people just don't have the bandwidth that stage in the project to do something like that. Yeah. Because by then they're so, they're so uptight, they've, they've spent months working on it, they're at the point when it's gonna be made, mm -hmm. they haven't, and they're doing something else, maybe a hundred other jobs. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think life is is about see most of this stuff it it looks really nice and detailed and thought yeah. through but it and that I mean I wanted this is a bit gauzed up now but it's like a inside of a jet engine yeah. it's the it's reflex port but if you see a product that's nice that you really like every bit of it the likelihood is that someone had that vision right at the beginning for all those things and they just got checked off one by one yeah. Because none of that, none of that stuff can come towards the end of a project because there's, there's so much to do in a project that yeah. you can't start adding detail like that at the end. So I think when you see a film that really has a coherence and works as a, as a piece of art, it's because the person who did it had a vision at the beginning yeah. and then the thing fits that vision and nobody else gets in the way of it during that, during the filming. Right. Because what happens is a director comes in or, uh, the right that it doesn't like what the writer's done and then the people who are paying the money they say hang on a minute it should have a happy ending and then then there's this and then the studio says something and then there's not enough money the actors got to go and do something else before you know it, it's a dog's dinner mm -hmm. and you think when you watch the film you think i could have done a better job myself <laughs> uh not in those circumstances right, right. with with you know with with unlimited budget and unlimited time and all the right people i could have done a much better job but i think a lot of people who their armchair critics don't really know what it takes to do a real thing. Well, I'll say it's so the, the thing about this radiation meter is I got a lot of, uh, and, and it's, it's always cool because the, things like this allow you to be able to talk to people that, that like, that's all that they do all the time. And, and yeah. so of course the Geiger counter people, um, that are out there and I mean, cause that's its own whole own niche, right? Um, of course. they, they, uh, they were really interested in this video and in what you're doing, partly because honestly, they don't have something that's that small. I mean, you know, so, so the no, fact no, that you guys were even I, looking at approaching it was like, 
Well, we looked yeah. at it. First of all, I thought, how hard can it be? And I looked online yeah. at some Geiger counters and thought, oh, you can make a Geiger counter. It's a metal tube, put a foil on the top, <laughs> right, the right. At the end, a little thin wire. Yeah. I was thinking, how hard could that be? <laughs> just, just, uh, just to back up a bit, actually, radio, right? Mm -hmm. How hard can that be? Right. You need an antenna, and the antenna needs to be a multiple or a fraction of the wavelength of the uh, and the wavelengths are in meters right yeah so uh, and normally you have an antenna it's a great big aerial you know when you take your fm radio right. guys out there you will know this and you take the aerial off right. all you get is, right right it doesn't work it doesn't magically pick up the signals it needs that antenna that's right. that's which, which you've hidden pretty well in that in right. that curly <laughs> wire can, yeah. you, can I tell you that was not a quick, easy fix? Oh, it wasn't. <laughs> no, 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 no. That wasn't the sort of thing. Hey, let's put it in the curly wire. We had wires coming out and going around the cuff. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you need to be able to fit them yourself. Does that mean you're going to drill in the back? I didn't think of leaving a hole in the back for the aerial mm -hmm. uh, antenna. Uh, we had a bolt going through. The bolt was joined onto the aluminium bit that was that could have made a loop and I say aerial. That curly wire isn't really long enough. And actually mm. in parts of the UK, especially in my office, mm -hmm. for example, and where the, the software uh, guy lived, mm -hmm. no signal. I mean, in America, you have kind of big radio stations all over the place. Right. In the UK, you can be somewhere where the signal's really low. Right. And in my office, I couldn't get any stations at all. I just said, well, this is useless. It's not even a product. It doesn't work. Yeah. I said, yeah. When I, when I took it and showed it in America, straight away it just went to like loads of stations yeah so I thought well, that's that's okay that's the biggest market that's fine <laughs> so the, but so the rad meter there's no way we could fit and so you could make a small ionizing radiation sensor yeah but it will pick up radiation when you're near Chernobyl and other places right or in fact as Richard found if you have one of those camping gas mantles yeah for the lamps the, yeah. the mantle they're radioactive you can they, oh, they yeah. give off some heat you can put them near a uh, radiation meter and you can get things. Bananas. Going, Bananas do too. Bananas, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we were thinking, could we sell it with those mantles? Could we sell it with a radiation source? And thinking, oh, no, that's, <laughs> like, no, that's never going to happen. <laughs> um, the other thing you have to work out, uh, which you'll know from your, your BlackBerry experience, is if we were to make a product that was as delicate as the thing that you've made mm -hmm. i mean you that isn't that's a lovely thing and what you've done is incredible but right. you couldn't sell that to the public and expect right. anyone not to break it in 10 minutes right and the other stuff we make that, that kit for example we do get a lot of people writing to us saying you know you didn't put the screws in you didn't do this or or mm -hmm. it's missing such and such i know that's not to be the case we we have anyway sent out stuff we, we always send out stuff yeah. but that that is made in a factory that's very expensive that makes lego kits oh they wow. wait they yeah. weigh each part before they put it together. They have wow. a tray which has boxes for every single part and a camera looking down and a big cross comes on the screen if there's a part missing from that box. Yeah. So the chances of somebody getting a product with no screws in it or yeah. no this in it or no that and it's very, very small. Yeah. And yet people do because they buy them secondhand, they buy them from a shop where someone's mm -hmm. opened it and taken some bits out. We yeah. don't know. Or, so they're, or can, they're pouring out that box, the, the little box you had with all yeah, the parts yeah. in it. They're probably I not know. doing it on a table like me. They're probably doing it on a carpet or something. Yeah, and, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, 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 and in some cases, people have said, you know, this came broken. And I, I've said, uh, written back, could you tell us so that we can tell the factory, right. we're going to give you a piece anyway, whether it's broken or not. And they go, no, it wasn't actually broken. I broke. <laughs> okay, whatever. But I think yeah. people start a bit defensively. But our, our goal is the happiness of our customers. Mm -hmm. And we have a certain amount put to one side for sending out bits. We, we, are, we ordered spares from the factory and, and stuff like that. So we, we have that. But for the, let's go back to the story of the rad meter. Because oh, yeah. There's no way. And so if we made a small one, it would be so insensitive that you'd have to be near some disaster to sense anything. And then that would be silly because it wouldn't be fun because right. you want to hold it up and make it go click. And... Um, so what the, the idea was that we would use EM radiation, like the yeah. thing you showed. Yeah. And if we had EM radiation, then it would have to have clicks like a Geiger counter. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's we can we can sort that out. But what we'd also want is the needle. Right. And there's no off-the-shelf needle that's exactly the same size. Now, if mm -hmm. you want to make your own one with any old shaped needle, that's fine. But if you want one with the needle that fits that exact thing, then you have to have a custom. Mm -hmm. And you have to have a custom coil. The, custom, the whole thing has to be custom. And then yeah, that's fine if you want to buy 100,000 units right. or you're happy to spend $10 on each one. Right. But if you want it to cost 
and you only want 10,000 units, don't forget, someone's going to make that product and sell it to you yeah. and only sell it for $10,000 and yeah. make it and sell you 10,000 of them. Yeah. I mean, you are talking, you, you imagine stacking that all up. And when there's the odd fan that says, yeah, well, I'd pay. Would you really pay a thousand dollars for that thing? Yeah. No, you wouldn't. Right, right. You want yeah. it. You want it. Even fifty dollars is going to be expensive. Yeah. We've got to, and for fifty dollars in the store, we've got to sell it to the store for twenty-five dollars because they want to make twenty-five bucks on it. Right. So when you start to see the stack up, when people say to us, "There's loads of people that would buy sonic screwdrivers," there are. Right. We our minimum order quantity is ten thousand units. So unless there are ten thousand people out there who want to buy one tomorrow. Right. And even if one guy every day writes to us, a different guy every day, one guy or gal right. writes to us every day for a year, it feels like a lot to us. Every day we get an email, please, 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 can you make a, a so, but even if you added them all up, over the year, it's still only 360 people. Oh, yeah. It's not, it's not 10,000 people. Yeah. It yeah. sounds like a lot. And if we go to a retailer, a lot of people write to us from Canada and say, why don't you sell your stuff in Canada? Like, don't, don't you like Canadians? We love them. Uh -huh. But it's the retailers won't buy it from us. We can't then sell it in Canada. Right. It's if we go to the retailer and say we've got these lovely sonic screwdrivers, please buy a thousand of them off us, and right. they say no, we're not interested. There's no market for it. Yeah. And these, but we're dealing with people who are writing from Canada, mm -hmm. or in fact anywhere in the world. Right. So, yeah. I mean, I think in the future, at some point this year, we'll probably start our own shop, and then we'll start selling our stuff, and we'll probably start shipping it all over the world. So we will address that issue a bit. Hmm. But even that is not easy for a small right. company to start doing. You can't those fully I, take out the middle piece. No. But, yeah, and I think you know, you know, you do a job, whatever job you do. <laughs> Thanks. If you, to, if, you try to, if you try to explain it to somebody else, and they go, "How hard can that be?" Right. No, it can. It can be I, hard. I do get that a lot at my other job, actually. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I do. always was going to do that and stuff. But yeah, I hear that one. <laughs> <laughs> and whatever you do, if you if you do it well, it's difficult. And if you do yeah. something, I can build that stuff. On dad can do. I mm -hmm. can build stuff, scratch build stuff that looks great. Mm -hmm. But if I was to give it to somebody else and worry about them cutting themselves on it or hurting oh, yeah. themselves or breaking it or it not working or in a in a year's time fading, all those things for a product have to be thought about, and they yeah. all take time, effort, and they cost money. Yeah, the materials have to be a certain quality, otherwise things break. Yeah. Um, they have to be put together in a certain way. Otherwise, and this is another thing that I never really ex appreciated until I started with working with a factory, is everything has got faults. Mm -hmm. The question is, what level are the faults? Can yeah. you see them and can you accept them? Yeah. And it's called the acceptable quality level, mm -hmm. the AQL. Right. And so for, in, a, in a computer screen, you're allowed to have six defunct pixels in the screen, for example, but they can't be next to each other. They have to be separated. Now, you wouldn't know that. But if you have to have them so that it's perfect, so there's no faults in it, nothing can be made with no faults. Right. So every it's it's a question of looking at the level that you're prepared to tolerate, and making sure your materials are the right materials. They're bought from the right sources, mm -hmm. and everyone will say, "Yeah, but you can buy this for nothing." Yeah, and then it will break straight away, and it and it'll rust, and it'll be right. rubbish, and no one will like it. Yeah. So I think when people, what's generally happened actually, and our fans are really good at this is if anyone has ever kicked off and I've gone back and done this whole hearts and minds thing and explained what it is, right. most people go, oh, I didn't realize. Yeah, that's great. And then, yeah. then they're a convert. After that, they realize that you've got their back. Yeah. You are not trying to rip off. Yeah. You are not trying to sell them something that's cheap and useless. You are trying to do the best job you can. Yeah. And this is the result of it. Yeah. It's as good as it can be. Yeah. For the money, it's not a mobile phone. We haven't made 20 million of them. No. It's a handmade thing, pretty much. And this is as good as it gets. Right. And so I know that box of components was annoying. And I have to say, I tried to think of lots of ways of doing it. And, and of course, the typical way of, of getting a kit, and I bought some kits, mm -hmm. is just to put all of that stuff in a cardboard box in, in poly bags. Yeah. Well, and it, it, we, we were talking earlier about things kind of that we recognize from like when I was younger that people these days wouldn't recognize as much as what I loved about actually that box was that you you had an illustration on the back on on it of of parts like random parts right yeah. which reminded me of of uh, th there used to be these toys and games the same thing you would get that box yeah. and it had that sort of thing on it and you dump it and it had all the all the parts you put with it uh, the kind of the equivalent of what was Lego back at that time yeah, yeah. had something like that and and we had some other kits too that you'd 
put together the uh, erector sets. Had that same, yeah. it, that's exactly what it reminded me of. When I was opening it up and I was pouring it out, it had the same, that was the idea that it had. And it was about the same size and you dumped it out and it had those little things that you could then adapt to whatever. So so to me, that actually was part of that world world experience. <laughs> it is, is, uh, the thing is that also often those sorts of bits of it, they're designed right at the beginning when, you've, when you're trying to design it. And at the end, when you get to the end, you think, actually, that might have been better if it wasn't a box or it had been this or if that mm. part had been somewhere else. But by then, it's too late. You're, mm -hmm. you know, if you get a second go round, mm. like I did with the screwdriver, mm -hmm. if you, um, I, on the uh, ready-built one, it comes with a bigger screwdriver because oh, obviously yeah. you, need to, you need the screwdriver to be able to put the, 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 the kits in. Um, but um, if we do another kit, the kit would be slightly changed to have a bigger screwdriver if we did another kit. If, if people wanted, if there was enough of a market for a, for a refresh of the kit, and I would sort some other things out. <clears throat> I'd probably change the rate. I'd change the manual a bit, and I might upgrade some of the screw fits and things like that. And I would change some of the things very slightly, but I would do a refresh. Um, but there were things like I let you into a secret. Are you all into a secret? Right. Uh, the, on the top of the box, it's got an aluminium plate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't actually tell it's aluminium. It just is. Yeah. But you can get cardboard that looks exactly like aluminium. Okay. And we could have done that. That would have saved us seventy thousand dollars. Wow. So as a company, we would have made absolutely made that a whole person's salary uh, extra, which we could have we could have put into the next product. We could have. Uh, um, we don't tend to live a lavish lifestyle, so it would have been put into the products. But instead of which, we had an aluminium plate. It's only afterwards when a new guy joined us and he said, you know, we could have got that made as like a cardboard with an aluminium print on it. look exactly the same because you can't see the thickness of it once it's there. And we put the two next to each other and you can't really tell the difference. Um, there are things on the phaser where there was a metal thing that was that ended up being metal, very expensive, it was a few dollars, sprayed with lacquer and then printed with tampe print, like pad printing. And to be fair, it could have easily been plastic. It, you can't even touch it really. And it was a few dollars. And for plastic, it would have been a couple of cents. Yeah. And it's stuff where you don't want to take a risk and do something that looks cheap. But you, so you take a bit of, but if, 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 if any of you guys out there, people listening to this, think if you had the choice of making another 70K this year yourself or making something aluminium, which no one could tell was aluminium, what would you do? How would, right. you, how would you play that one? And then in the end, you're spending the money because you want to spend the money. It's like if you buy something with a brand name on it, you just want the brand name. My, my view is buy things, have things in your life. But well, I give you two views. First of all, never allow yourself to be defined by the things that you own. Right. You own them. Do not allow them to define who you are. OK, that's that's like them owning you. And that's wrong. It's sad for you. It's sad for everybody else. And it plays the game into the heart of the big companies that basically just want to get your money and they don't want to give you value for it. Buy things that enrich your life, that are lovely, that make you feel good. And it's not about the brand. If that is a big deal to you, OK, fine. But usually it's about the quality of the thing. Buy the quality, buy it once. Buy something you love and let yourself enjoy it. And then everything's going to be sweet. I think if you buy things just because they're expensive or you buy things just because they have a brand on them because you think it'll make you a better person and you think it'll make you, everyone else think you're better, then that's really fake. And I think from our product's point of view, we have never gone out of our, never tried to make something that hasn't had a whole, light, whole heart and soul in it. And one of our early days with the wand is we actually made it hard to buy it and find it on our website. You had to go through a few pages, you had to flick through things. Do you really want to get it? Because it's hard to use. It's hard to learn. You want to really want it. We tried giving them away at a show, a TED. TED conference came to us and said, we have a goodie bag. Can you give us some wands? And we were starting off early days, and we had not a lot of money. And we did something like 800 wands, I think. It was a very expensive project for us, free. Mm -hmm. We did our own website for it. We put a special print on the outside. They said it goes to all these CEOs. We got two comments back from it. One. I found this under a table at a show I went to. What does it do? And one, my brother went to a show and had this given to him, and he's given it to me. What does it do? Of mm -hmm. the 750 we gave out, now maybe some, 
were loved by people and they never even got in touch with us. Right. But the, the long and short of it is if you don't want a product, it doesn't matter how lovely it is, it's garbage. So if I was to give you a digital camera and it's not a brand you want or, it's, or you have a digital camera or use your phone, you get it and you think, what the hell is this? I might have spent a couple of hundred dollars on it. You don't want it. It's in the drawer and you never use it. It's garbage. And it might have had millions of pounds worth of research gone into making it, but you don't want it. So it's nothing. Yeah. So I think, think of the things that you really want. And I try to make our products lovely. I don't make anyone buy them. So when people ring up and they say, I feel really, I feel really bummed. Well, they, they write to us and say, I feel like I've been ripped off. Well, yeah, you don't have to, you don't have to buy it. It's, it's the best it can be. It's, it's put together with all the love that we put into it. And if there are things that are wrong with it, they may well have happened since it went out of my control. Right. I mean, it's been made by the factory. The factory is a very expensive, very ethical, lovely, large factory in China that I've been to many times that has a great social program. It supports its workers. It's a fabulous place. And it's very expensive. It's not a cheap factory by any means. And they make everything to the best they can possibly do it. And they're even more pernickety than we are. And then it will go out into the marketplace. Who knows what happens to it once it goes out there? When it goes to the store, what happens to it when it's on the store shelves, when it's uh, you know, waiting to be sent out? You don't know. Right. So but we, we, try, we take a very generous view of that when people write to us and stuff like that. So uh, I don't think we have a problem there. I'm just saying that I think in the world, I think if we all were a little bit less consumerist and we're a little bit more genuine about what we needed and what we wanted for ourselves, and we would be in the world. I mean, this whole thing of lockdown, and we haven't mentioned lockdown, but it's been a weird thing for us all. But I think it's let a lot of people to reevaluate their lives and what they what means something to them and what doesn't mean something to them. Well, I, I've got some questions for you that people gave me. Okay, go on then. So this is this is actually a uh, poll that we had out. I think YouTube just pulled pulled the polls, but at the same time, our poll that we had out there asked this question: Which one does best describes you, maker? Collector, gamer, or cosplayer? Maker. Without mm. a question, a shadow of doubt, I could say that's true. Easily make. Well, which best describes you? Star Wars, Star Trek, Doctor Who, or Harry Potter? Oh my god. Star Wars, no. Star <laughs> Trek. <clears throat> Harry Potter, I, uh, Doctor Who. I think it would have to be uh, Star Trek. Star Trek, I think okay. that the whole thing of Star Trek with the kind of, it's, 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 well, I think it's sort of very species-wide sort of appeal and it's kind of sentiment and everything like that. Plus, I don't know if you know, but I, I wrote and submitted a Voyager script full and it was rejected. This but really? I, it was, <laughs> and in the six weeks it took to be rejected, it was one of the happiest six weeks of my life when I imagined my life working in California as a writer for Star Trek. Oh, yeah. I wrote the whole thing properly, wrote a proper script, to, you know, really, I thought it was cool. Great. story um i've since written a novel which never got published a uh, science fiction but i mean so i think maker and star trek 100 percent. okay perfect so uh, the third one is if uh the sorting hat picked you for one of the houses at hogwarts uh which house <laughs> would you be in well <clears throat> i think without a shadow of doubt it'd be gryffindor because that's the i like i like that I just like that. I like the sentiment. I suppose that Harry Potter's in Gryffindor. Is that right? I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I think Sly Slytherin, no. I, I like the dark side. Of, I like a bit of the dark side. And the other two, they just... You don't want to be a Hufflepuff me. kind of person. No, nah, a bit, a bit <laughs> late. Uh, so Gryffindor, yeah. And I know that's a kind of cheesy answer, but I, I imagine loads of people would say that. But anyway. <laughs> What's the coolest thing on your desk? <clears throat> what is the coolest thing on my desk? Let me have a look. Um... What well, apart from my wallet? <laughs> uh, got you there. So, what's the? Uh, that's a very good question. I would. Oh my! Right, right. Well, I'm going to be really prosaic because I've got some very nice things. And now, when you say cool, I'm just looking over my desk here. Um, I've got a bunch of stuff that's just actually mostly junk. But I, and I know this is going to sound really weird. And people are probably not going to really get it. But as an old school guy, Pilot Fine Liner, I've drawn so many things with this um, lovely water-based felt-tipped pen. To me, this is such a cool thing. It's the beginning of every dream 
when you start sketching something out and you start thinking about how it's going to be. And, and even if when life has gone to the point when you're not going to use your pilot fine line, you're going to use in your head, your mm -hmm. model, and then it's going to go onto the screen, you're still mentally drawing stuff out. And the thing with the pilot fine liner is you can draw really fine lines with it and then use the pencil bullet point to go over the outside lines. And I've made so much money as a freelancer, as a designer, and so many ideas have come. They started with this pen. So That's I would say this is pretty cool. If I look behind in sort of desk, if I, this is lovely. I love this. This is from Blade Runner, one of my favorite films of all time, oh, Blade yeah. Runner 2049. And the reason I love this is because this signifies the part of uh, the main character who believes himself to be a real human being. And this is his memory. And the whole thing about Blade Runner was this, this idea, which Philip K. Dick wrote about, is uh, in, he loved the idea of memory. We can remember it for you wholesale. Philip, Philip K. Dick book, which turned into Total Recall. Mm. In Blade Runner, the memories of the things, the sort of memories that she has, the photographs, are what distinguishes a human being from a replicant. And yet, if you give a replicant memories, then they don't know whether they're human or not. Mm. And he finds this in, a, in an old uh, boiler, and he remembers putting it there. And he doesn't, re he doesn't realize that those memories are fake. They were given to him by someone else who actually put it there. Right. So this, to me, and this is a lovely prop. It's a, it's a NECA thing, actually. And I oh, bought yeah. it online because I, I didn't buy it at the right time, so I had to go and buy it off eBay. And um, a friend of mine uh, on, on one of the groups I'm in sent me this. I don't know if you can see it here. I'll, I'll bring that board as well. As, uh, sold me this limited edition Blade Runner whiskey. Um, yeah. If you haven't seen the film 2049, uh, I and you haven't seen the original, I, f I first a recommend you see the original yeah, because more. it's a 30 year old film and and unbelievably good. I watched it the other day with my kid for the first time, one of them. But 2049, to me, I don't know, it's as a sequel, it just takes it to another whole level. It's the detail, the the, the unbelievable thinking that's gone into it. And the great thing about original Blade Runner, if you read the book first. Do Android's dream of electric sheep, mm -hmm. the, the original proper version. It's such a massive story and so many layers. And the clever thing about the film Blade Runner is he takes one core of it, the core part of it, and thus concentrates on that. And in my view, that's almost the perfect way to translate a complicated story into a, into a piece of film. So I love that. Anyway, but yeah, so I think. I think this is probably the coolest thing because that's where all the all the great things start, and then this is probably the second coolest thing. I, I was going to ask you the question: uh, What's the uh, what's the most prized geeky possession? But you just I think you just kind of showed me that. Um, um, well, yeah, that, uh, my my daughter gave me these glasses for um, for a, a Christmas present, a uh, birthday present, and the, these are the ones from the original Blade Runner where he drinks. Uh, actually, as as sci-fi things, they're pretty cool, but. As drinking vessels, they're totally useless. I mean, everyone oh, really? will know that, that no one's mouth is actually straight. Yeah. And that if you try to put the corner of it in your mouth, it dribbles off the it's side. A so it's actually, glass. Yeah. <laughs> really very hard to drink out. But they're extremely expensive and they're made of crystal glass and they wow. feel really good in the hand. So yeah, there's a few things. Um I've got I've got this, which was a this was a I mean, people will love this thing. As as a as a Doctor Who fan, I is that the journal? Yeah, it's it's a, it's not the original, but it's a very wow, very it looks like it though. It's a very good replica. Yeah, uh, made by someone, handmade by someone. I had to persuade Richard that it was worth getting as a as a reference piece, and I've got a load of things like this sort of thing that um, I feel to myself, why have I collected them? Because I think in, in some respects, a lot of stuff that you can get, it, it feels. A bit like, a bit like junk after you've got it because you get it and you think, well, it's just there and it's. But if you buy the right things and they uh, and they enrich your life and they increase your sort of enjoyment of your of your um, chosen franchise, I like. That's why I love that little toy, the little toy uh, horse because it's so well done. It feels so right in the hand, yeah. and I think in life as as makers. People who uh, I've, I've told my kids, be content creators, whatever it is, play an instrument, get out on stage, paint things, do stuff, create content, create mm -hmm. stuff. If you are just a consumer, 
then it's, it's such a, a much less world if you can create stuff. And um, so I think when I build my things, I think if they were to add to people's lives and have a function, something that you could justify to yourself, it's not just a thing to look at, although that in itself, don't get me wrong, figurines, paintings, lovely stuff like that would be nice to have those sorts of things. Right. But you can do stuff. I, I'm going to get something off the wall. I'm going to show you something I've got on my wall. Oh, you, yeah. Have I, have I, have I, right, let me just do yeah. this one. Right. <clears throat> now, anybody out there could make this thing. It's very easy to make, but it does look cool. Let me show it. We had the BBC came here mm -hmm. and I wanted to impress them that we were really into, into Doctor Who. I, I built a few Doctor Who things for my kids before. Yeah. This. Oh, that is cool. That is neat. Look okay. At, so, so you've got some layering going on. That yeah, yeah. It's two dimensional and then you've got an actual Let me just do two, this three dimensional TARDIS. Oh, and it lights oh. up. That so, is so cool. This is so simple, right? Yeah. First of all, this is a frame from a framing company. I just went to a local framing company and said, can you frame it? Uh -huh. um, I specified exhibition glass because I wanted it to be really cool. Uh -huh. And then this, this border. And the frame's kind of old. These, these layers, they are literally printed on inkjet paper of the vortex I just got off online. Oh. And I just cut them out and just stuck bits of card in between them and just stuck them at different layers. And that thing that is the TARDIS, it probably cost about 10 bucks. It's a metal, a die cast metal TARDIS uh -huh. that I just bought online and I filed the corner off it and just stuck it with glue gun glue on the back panel. And then that flashing blue light is just behind. It was just literally, I found something that had a flashing blue light in like a bicycle or something like that. And I just wired it up so that you could just turn it on. So I mean, that it is, is an cool. afternoon. It's a fun afternoon project. There's something yeah. very simple that anybody could do. Yeah. And yet, if you put it all together, it looks really very expensive and yeah. very cool. Yeah. It looks... I have to say the frame was a, like the frame and the glass was 120 bucks. So yeah, it's... yeah, that's how it works. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, man. But, but, but the rest of it was absolutely dead easy to do and fun. Yeah. And it, on dad can do that was the level of those projects. I just thought yeah. I'd show that to you. Wow, that is um, so cool. Oh, and then it's got, obviously, you've got this bit here. I went to my local oh, sh into the shoe, vortex. Men sh shoe menders and said, can you do that? <laughs> and uh, you can see in the back that the, the whole thing in the back is a, bit, it's a little bit. Um, and I've got this old switch I found off an old television. That's another thing. Yes. If you throw stuff away, like the other day, I, I got a skip and I was throwing a load of stuff away. And I, I, th I threw some things away that were in the garage. And I realized that one of them had these lovely big brass hinges on it. Yeah. And unscrew those brass hinges and throw the rest of the stuff away. I'm not a great hoarder, but if I see something like I'm throwing something away, it's got a lovely switch on it. I'll just cut that switch off and keep it just in case I might need it for something later. And in fact, that is where that lovely switch came from. Oh, really? <laughs> it just great. came on some old piece of junk that I saw. And, it had this, and it's got this, I don't know, it feels to me. Um, I'm going a bit off, off piece here, but um, I think I never actually think that we finished about the the... I think the rad meter was just too expensive. And, and I wanted to say the final thing about the rad meter, because I know you probably may have a couple more questions, but I want to bottom that out. Is that for a company like ourselves, who has to invest in, in, in the product, we need retailers who are experts at selling stuff right. to buy it from us. Right. And then they sell it to you guys. And if a retailer says to us, hey, and they used to, there was a company called ThinkGeek who went, got taken over by GameStop and then basically got sort of, sort of almost rubbed out. Yeah. But I think it was great. We had a great buyer there. And he would say, you know, that's a lovely product. I'll take 10K of those. And that underwrites the whole project for us. We can mm -hmm. then spend all the money we want making it, knowing that we've got sales of 10,000 units. Right. And we knew he was good for his word. If he said it, he would do it. And so we would then put everything we could into it. Now, what happened with the, with the Pip-Boy, sadly, when 76 wasn't as successful as everyone hoped it would be, for, for all good reasons, but it right. just wasn't. All the retailers, you said, oh, you know, we wanted 15,000 units of that. We don't know. We want five or two. Oh. And we were already buying the components and making stuff. Right. And as, as a small company, we can't just absorb that. That, right. that costs. We can't just make them in the hope that somebody will buy them. Yeah. And genuinely, why would fans want to buy something that they hate or that they feel they've been ripped off? So yeah. there isn't a market for it. Mm -hmm. The fact that 
later on maybe there is a market it's too late really by then right. and we had already started making the radio and the the the, the screen i felt because that nearly got cancelled without mm. the screen the radio is fine but really you need the screen to light up yeah, Even yeah. Just a light, light behind it you yeah. just need something and so I pushed forward with the screen, even though the market wasn't really there for it at the time, the retail market, so that at least fans that had the radio could have the screen. Yeah. And the rad meter was just a step too far. It was another few, well, uh, it's like 50K or something to do it. It's, it's a lot of money, money we didn't have right. for retailers who didn't really want to buy it. Right. So it's sad because we have, as you saw at E3, we had an actual working one yeah. that's there with a meter going up and down. I don't know if that actually sensed anything. And that's the other thing. Of course, if you're going to sell a rad meter, it's got to sense EM radiation. Yeah. And if you haven't actually worked that part of your design through, but the rest looks good, it looks great on video, but of course right. it doesn't actually work. Yeah, yeah. No, it doesn't work. No one's interested in buying it. Yeah. So there was, there was a catalog of things there that stopped us, but we went, a lot of work was put into it, about eight months, and we got really close to making it, but just stalled at the last part of making that. You- Otherwise, the, the thing would have been the whole lot. The, the piece that I didn't show, the, the thing that I am, well, I got stopped on is, is I was actually working on this. And oh, yes. the, uh, so But the roller, I found out the roller for the, uh, for the months, um, the letters kidding. had to be super, super small when yeah. I got the roller. And so I got a, um, you remember the old, old calculators that had the magnifying? Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 that that I put that in there, and so I kind of got around that. But I found out, you know, clock making seems like it'd be easy. You know, it's just gears. No. But it's so no. it's we that's looked, where I looked I've at got it. Stuff. We looked at it. We were going to put an LCD in there. We yeah. looked at it. Um, for a start, the design doesn't fit the rollers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's if, not if real. It world. Needs those rollers <laughs> in there. It had to be like that thick yeah. to fit the roller. And it's, it's very simple gotchas like that when you get, we actually looked at it and thought, how could the mechanism work? The other thing is with those odor meters, they count round. Yeah. They're actually not very simple at all. They're very complicated. Yeah. Loads of gears, that's expensive. They can all go wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, it locks up. It locks up a yeah. lot. I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I gave up on it. That was, so I didn't want so, anyone to even know I did it. It wasn't worth it. <laughs> so I knew people I would bog me about it. There's a few things we've talked about that that's how I feel about those. Yeah. You go, you go 90% of the way there and you realize that that last 10% is the difference between it being a product and it yeah. not being a product. And yeah. it's too late then to back up. Yeah. It's just so sad when you get to that stage, you just think this would be so nice and, and the yeah. people out there would love it. But you know also that a lot of people would hate it and it wouldn't work properly and it would be dangerous. And then, yeah. I mean, the original phaser, just to give you an idea, I wanted the things to look like and be like the real thing. Yeah. So when we were talking about doing the phaser, having done the sonic screwdrivers, I said the phaser should really have a laser coming out of it. <laughs> I mean, really. Yeah. And um, if you get, I've got this green laser that someone gave me years ago. Mm-hmm. Actually, to be fair, I've got rid of it because it's it's clearly lethal. Yeah. Um, that when you shine up in the sky, even in moderately overcast conditions, you can see the beam. That <laughs> is cool. Like, yeah, it's about it's about uh, a what or so. It's, it's anyway completely illegal. Yeah, and I, and a guy gave it to me as a friend of mine. So I bought I bought these in America, and in the UK, I think you can't have anything that's over ten milliwatts or something. So it, you <laughs> it basically anyway, you could shoot planes down with it, and yeah. so obviously it's not the sort of thing. And when I had it in my house, which I did for a few months. I stored it with the laser, the battery, and the housing in separate drawers in the house in case my kids found it. It's like a right. loaded gun. You know? Right, right. So in the end, I gave it to a guy as an astronomer, and apparently they can they 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 stick it on the side of the telescope and they point it up at the stars and they can see where they're they're looking because the, oh, the beam just cool. goes on forever. Yeah. Anyway, Rich, I said on the packet it says ten milliwatts, mm-hmm. so it's it's below the the threshold. Right. So Rich said I'll send it to a. And the, the, the phaser looks so cool with the beam coming out. It's like the real thing. Anyway, he sends it off to be tested. It's like you know, thousands of milliwatts. It's stupidly powerful. If oh. you shone it in a room and it bounced off anything and shone in your eye, you'd be blind. So oh, yeah. You could have that as a product, can you? It's, so you can it's see cool, though, away. to think it was possible. That's all this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there, and there are people online who've got lasers coming out of phasers where they're shooting balloons with them and stuff like that. But, yeah. but they're having to be in, in, in rooms with, with double locked doors with yeah. goggles on. Yeah. It's like shooting, just randomly shooting a bullet round. Yeah. You can't do it. 
Yeah. So, yeah, there are lots of ideas that we have. And many people say, why didn't you do X? You could think, yeah, well, we, we would have loved to have done right. that. But yeah. there's no way you can do that as a proper product. Well, I, an I, I was surprised because BlackBerry, actually, in the end, I, I, I was afraid somebody out there was going to take this thing apart wrong. And because it's dangerous, you know, I actually had the the first one where I ruined. Uh, there's a small component that that prevents it, uh, limits the amount of electricity. Um, yeah, yeah. And so it doesn't overdraw, and that was the part that I broke. And I was trying to charge that, and uh, luckily caught it in, ha in time. But it was it was over. It was it was going to combust. Oh, it could, it could you know? certainly burn your hat. It could burn oh, your yeah. house down. Yeah, and so. Um, so yeah, I, I I put those those warnings all over the place because yeah, yeah people are out there. They're going to do something. <laughs> so I just got to be careful. Well, about no, you've got to be so there. careful because yeah. um, a friend of mine uh, who worked at Think Geek actually they mm -hmm. had a situation where they sold a, a helicopter, one of those little remote control helicopters. Uh -huh. and one of the and worse, it was one of their most successful things. It just went gangbusters. They sold loads of it. There was something wrong with the charging and there's polymer, polymer oh, lithium no. batteries and it burnt someone's house down. Oh, yeah. Luckily, nobody was killed because yeah. they, they smelt the smoke and they ran out of the house, but they lost everything. Yeah. And he said to, to have designed a product that has trashed someone's life and then the thought that it might kill someone if they yeah. don't recall them all. And that then they might go bust as a company because I mean, they're trying to recall them yeah. all. It's costing hundreds of K. I mean, it's a nightmare. And I think yeah. when you design a product, obviously at the back of your mind is – have I taken all reasonable steps to make right. sure that this will be safe? Right. Uh, when you're doing something yourself, and you, I mean, on, on my website, that can do. I, if, I, if ever I mention using cyanoacrylate superglue, uh -huh. I always say, you know, you can stick body parts together with it. It can, right. it could kill you. Do not do this. Yeah. It's very dangerous. There's an emergency can, room, is it? If you're, <laughs> yeah. 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 Your hands are stuck together, you yeah. stuck your mouth together, or your eyes together, or whatever, or you're a baby and you've just been chewing on it. I yeah. mean, great. I have done that, shit. though, before. It's, it's that split second. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Oh, no. <laughs> and you know what? It sticks skin together so much better than anything else, oh, doesn't yeah. it? So one of the things that was on here, because I almost forgot about it, was what is your favorite tool? But, uh, yeah, what can, as far as a maker goes, what, what is What's your favorite, favorite tool? tool? I suppose... Um, is it something that's what? accessible to everyone, or is it yeah, something that, yeah, that's say, market I great? Say, I would say... It depends on the time in your life mm. what your favorite tool that you would use the most is. Mm -hmm. And it depends on the job you're doing because, obviously, for different jobs, you have a tool that's used more than anything else. So I would say from the maker point of view, um, when I was doing making from junk, the, the, without a shadow of a doubt, it would be the glue gun. They're 10 bucks. Anyone can buy one. Be careful because you can burn yourself with the glue. It's hot. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but you can do so much with it. And it's so quick. It's instant. You, you, you glob, you stick, it sticks. Right. You can make fun little things. You can even use it as part of the product like I did with the wand. Right. Uh, if I'm doing DIY, the tool I use the most probably with DIY, and I do a lot of DIY because I love building the house up and stuff like that, um, I am guessing it would be something like the uh, – like one of the saws i've got some chop a chop saw that's really accurate because if you're building stuff um every time uh it's a good thing try try doing diy try building your own stuff try doing home improvement because um or working on your car i used to work on my car the whole time uh -huh. and a, so a socket set change things uh, obviously be safe when you do it but um every time you do a job yourself you save yourself a few hundred or maybe a few thousand bucks you can buy a really nice piece of kit like if you're doing I built a whole games room. So in doing oh, yeah. that, I can buy a top saw. And I've always wanted a really nice one that, that, that saws back, that saws, you know, like four by two pieces of wood really right. nicely and neatly. It's all sharp. The, I suppose, actually now thinking about it, the electric drill. I think probably the electric <laughs> drill, the really nice Makita electric drill with hammer, two speed, you know, with a drill bit, with a screw bit on it, probably yeah. used more than anything else. Yeah. Um, but each time you do a job, you buy something nice. Make sure you clean them up afterwards and you keep them all really tidy. And over the years, because I'm nearly 60, so mm -hmm. I've done a lot of building in my time, I've got a complete kit of, of you know, plumbing equipment, pipe, pipe fitting equipment, woodworking equipment, and it all gets used. And each time you use it, it's, you get so much value out of it, so yeah. much fun. I think I covered the questions. Actually, if, if you have a prop, any prop, what it would be. You, you basically showed me everything that's, that's on here. As far as, uh, uh, you know, 
You covered the I gamut. Had, if I really had a prop and I was mm -hmm. allowed to have any prop mm -hmm. from anything, um, I think I would. I I bought um, a a Blade Runner blaster. Oh, you did. And, and um, from a guy in the U.S. And um, this is a hilarious story. And if you've got two more minutes, I'll tell yeah, you. Yeah. So we went into a pub in New York, a bar, and we had a couple of pints. And this guy came over to give us. Now, in the UK, it's illegal to buy something that is a gun. It's mm. illegal to buy something that looks like a gun. Oh, yeah. And it's illegal to import something that looks like a gun. Apparently, I didn't know that. But, huh. but, uh, because obviously, a thing that looks like a gun, you could rob a bank with it, even if it isn't a real gun. So it's it's possession of an offensive weapon. And then there's very much, there's other problems and other things as well. Anyway, so we're in a bar. And this guy comes over, and a friend of mine in the UK on a forum wanted wanted one as well and couldn't buy it in the UK. So I said, well, when I buy wine in America and I bring it home to the UK, I, I didn't realize the import thing, I'll um, buy one for you at the same time. You can just give me the cash and I'll just I'll just mail it to you. Yeah. So uh, so this guy in a, in a bar in New York just comes in. We're having a pint. He unrolls this roll of, like, thing. And these two things that look exactly like proper full-on handguns with up and over double-barreled big handles big pistol grips roll out on the table mm. no one in the place bats an eyelid huh. and then i give him a, a couple of i think it was a couple of k <laughs> bucks because they're like a grand each mm. and then roll them back up bubble wrap in cardboard boxes <laughs> go to jfk so i get to jfk and i'm in McHugh going to them and they said so sir have you got anything of these things on this list, right. uh, well, oh, so I won't try and do the New York accent. That's terrible. But have you got anything on the list that looks like it could be? A, uh, so I said, well, I have a thing in my baggage that looks like a gun, but it's not a gun. Right. So she said, "Gee, would you like to get it out and show me?" So I said, "Okay." So I get the box up on the table. I get out the bubble wrap. I unroll it, and out flops this thing. And within about twenty seconds, two policemen. <laughs> cops whatever you want to call them are on me pointing their guns at me <laughs> oh, saying step back from the weapon right so <laughs> i'm going i'm going geez absolutely it's not really a gun it looks like one and then uh they say why did you bring that here and I said well it's a prop and uh, my business is props and i said let me show you and i leant forward <laughs> to pick it up so, so they didn't actually floor me at that point. I suppose my English accent had something to probably had a lot to do with it. Well, I had to say that. But anyway, I back away straight away. No, I'm not touching it. You can pick it up. Right. It, it, don't handle it like that. It cost me a grand and it's fragile. This guy's pulling it and trying to open it. He oh. opens the barrel and out, out pop six bullets, right? Like real uh, ones? Luckily, yeah. Oh. With the, with the tips drilled out. Oh, okay. Uh, so they're my hand. Yeah. Oh, it's looking really bad. But they've obviously got no gunpowder in them because the guy's taken the gunpowder out, luckily. So um, <clears throat> anyway, after some very, very frightening minutes, about 20 minutes of ex trying to explain, there's a little bit of laughter. The guy showed me what a real hollow point looks like, sort of like a tip with like stars in it and shows me that would actually like a dinner plate. It would stop oh, me yeah. dead and all this stuff. We go to the x-ray machine. He wouldn't look down the, he wouldn't look down the uh, end of the gun. He just wouldn't do it. Right. But uh, it's, if you look down the end, it's just blank. You, there's right. nothing in it. Anyway, they x-ray it, and it's fine. And They let you go like, take it on, huh? Yeah. Just put it in, put it in, they said put it in the hold. In the UK, we come in. My bag isn't delivered at all onto the carousel. Mm -hmm. The thing's going round. And eventually, I go to services and say, I had a bag. And they go, oh, you're the one that has a thing that looks like a gun in it. So mm -hmm. I said, yeah, that's me. They said, oh, here, here it is. They just give it to me. I go through the something to declare window. You know, there's the nothing to declare or something to declare. And the woman says, what, what have you got to declare? I said, I've got a thing in my bag that looks like a gun, but isn't really. So she said, oh, show it to me. So I just unwrap it. I get about halfway. She goes, oh, yeah, that's fine. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I brought it back out. It was like, okay, that's fine. And I just walked through. So on the English side, it was completely, in, in England the... where it's completely banned, yeah. nothing's allowed. That's yeah. completely fine. It was fine. And then later, Richard said to me, do you know um, it's illegal to import it unless it's your business? So I, knowing this, I set up a little web page for you with this blaster on it as a project. Uh -huh. uh, um, anyway, so you got that whole thing. 
So, so I mean, it is, it is our business. Right. And the fact is, it's never been out of its cupboard, and it it's just a plastic thing with some. That's but anyway, that was my that was my story where I nearly got shot. I haven't taken this. I mean, people always ask me, well, why don't you take it to a conference or why don't you whatever? It's a, I I mean, especially with the so now it has that electronic thing in here, yeah. And with everything else, if this went underneath an X-ray, yeah, it, it, and it has the wires. <laughs> Yeah. There's no way I'd be able to take that on a uh, plane. I've, I've had things taken off me. I've had the sonic screwdriver taken off me where he said, it says the word screwdriver on the packet and it's longer than seven inches. And I said, yeah, but it's oh, not a screwdriver, is it? Right. He said, but it says it is. And I said, but it isn't. Oh. Take the box. You're going to let me you're gonna let me take the box, but you want to take the thing that isn't a screwdriver. And he goes, yeah, well, it's... I said, why don't we unscrew it and take it in half? Then it would be less than seven inches long. Yeah. And you get into an argument. In the end, it just goes in the not trash. Not worth it. Oh, right. man. You know what? I, when you do lots of products over the years, you would uh, pick up things like, uh, you know, prototypes and various things. Mm -hmm. But in the end, you end up with so much clutter that some of it you throw away. And I can I can understand when you talk to some of these prop people, like Greg Jean, who's got the phaser and the communicators. Mm -hmm. so in the old days, they were just literally at the end of the show. It was just everything was just thrown in the bin. Yeah. Because there's so much junk, and of course later. Uh, people say, well, how would you, why would you do that? That's millions of dollars worth of stuff just thrown away. But I think that um, it'd be like keeping all the cars you ever owned. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, sure, those cars you owned 30 years ago are like antiques now and yeah. everyone would be loving them. But where would you store them? And, and the fact is every time you buy a car, you sell the other one because it's that few extra few dollars helps you buy the next one. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's, it's a fallacy, really. I think if you have stuff yourself... Someone wrote to me once and Dad can do it. If you're building stuff with your kids and you want it like hair, heirloom stuff to keep forever, mm -hmm. first of all, you've got to use the right kind of adhesives. You mustn't use tape and various things. Right. But also, the key thing is don't throw it away. When you go through the, the loft or the attic and you look at the stuff and you think, oh, this junk, put it to one side and think, in 20 years, that will be quite cool. I mean, what, what, what junk like that today would you keep and think in maybe – hundred years time would actually be something good but you'd have to keep it for that hundred years yeah. for it to be worth anything and yeah. for the for the 70 of those years it's just junk that's getting in the way yeah yeah so you know and even then you wouldn't know whether it'd be any worth having at the end of it it's kind of funny well you've been so awesome for doing this i really appreciate it <laughs> thank you so much for your time to learn more about chris bernardo and the wong company visit the links below also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel, hit that like button, and stay tuned for our next episode. This is your Geek Fix.